live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basak, in for Matt Miller. And from our studios in Washington, D.C., I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, SEC Chair Gary Gensler this week faces the House as the industry descends on D.C. to push for regulatory clarity from lawmakers. Plus, MoneyGram announces plans to launch its own non-custodial digital wallet. We talked to the CEO about the push into digital assets. And we are just one week away from the beginning of the Sam Bankman free trial. We update you on the latest as he seeks to be released from jail ahead of the proceedings. That's all ahead, but first we take a look at the markets. We're looking at Bitcoin down about two tenths, three tenths of one percent, hovering around 26,000. This is below that 30,000 high we have been seeing. It has been trading range bound around uncertainties about the future of the digital asset. We're also looking at micro strategy, erasing all of its gains from yesterday after announcing more purchases of Bitcoin between the range of 25,000 and 30,000 dollars. Kaylee, it is down today about 2.3 percent. I do want to point up to the green on the screen though, because we are looking at Ether getting a little bit of a lift, about two tenths of one percent. And if you take a look at it, staking is one of the topics that might come up out the House Financial Services hearing just tomorrow. This is a place that the SEC has been keeping its eye on the staking businesses across the crypto industry. Lastly, I want to point out Chainlink. This is a token that has been up more than seven percent nearly on the week, up about two percent in the last 24 hour period. And it is an indication of just how much love coins outside of Bitcoin are getting, even with the uncertainties surrounding the industry. Okay, well, one of those uncertainties, Shanali, does have to do with the regulatory picture. And as you just alluded to, SEC Chair Gary Gensler is scheduled to appear before the House Financial Services Committee tomorrow as market participants look for any hint on crypto-related policy. I spoke to Chair Gensler in an exclusive interview last week. I also tried to get a hint. Here's what he told me. This is a field. Uh, kind of reminds me a bit of the 1920s securities markets 100 years ago where a lot of people were getting hurt and Congress came along and said we've got to clean that up and of course we had the Great Depression and um, the securities laws apply to crypto security tokens and there's nothing incompatible with those tokens with the securities laws Investors still benefit from disclosure, and investors get to choose based on that disclosure. Investors benefit from laws against fraud and manipulation and, and other um, conflicts in the markets. And we've just seen so many people hurt and lost their money, hoping for a better future. And there's so many hucksters and fraudsters in this field. Heard that one before. Joining us now is Justin Slaughter. He is policy director at Paradigm. He's here with me in our Washington, D.C. studio. So, Justin, great to see you, of course, here in Washington or realistically a little ways down the road on Capitol Hill. There is legislation that has passed through the House Financial Services Committee where the chair will be testifying tomorrow in regard to market structure, delineating what the SEC should have control over versus the CFTC. But also here in Washington, we're just days away from what is looking increasingly likely to be a government shutdown. So where does this list on the ranking of priorities? How likely are we actually to see the House move forward on crypto legislation? Good to be here, Kaylee. I am confident we're going to see the House move forward and pass comprehensive crypto market structure legislation this fall on the full House floor. Now, admittedly, as you note, it may happen later in the fall because, you know, it is the case that when there's a government funding fight, that takes precedence over everything else. This one could extend for a little while. But after that, I actually think it's a great opportunity for Congress to come together and pass something that both Democrats and Republicans in the House can support. Well, that's in the House, though. And as with the spending fight, it's a matter of things that need to be reconciled between both chambers, the House and the Senate. So even if it passes the House, have you had any conversations with Sherrod Brown, the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, about this? Do you have an understanding of how he might be feeling about this legislation? So I haven't personally talked to Chair Brown. My understanding talking to other people, though, is there are a number of senators that want to see legislation pass. And I think even Chair Brown is indicating he understands this industry is going to persist. It's going to exist. It's time to come up with some rules of the road. I mean, in many ways, that's what we really are looking for is clarity along the lines of what Congress did in the 1933 Securities Act. We just need that for crypto. Mm. 
Well, of course, while we in Washington are paying attention to this kind of legislation, we also are following President Biden, who has just arrived at the UAW picket line in Michigan. Let's listen to the president of the United States. John Payne, your president. Yeah. during World War II. It's where they built the B-24 Liberator bomber. You know, that, that bomber, they built one of those per hour when they were at their peak. It's what helped us win the war. So today, 80 years later, we find ourselves here again with the arsenal of democracy. It's a different kind of arsenal of democracy, and it's a different kind of war we're fighting. Today, the enemy isn't some foreign country miles away. It's right here in our own, in our own area. It's corporate greed. Yeah. Yeah. And the weapon we produce to fight that enemy is the liberators, the true liberators. It's the working class people, all of you working, working your butts off on those lines to deliver great product for our companies. That's right. That's how we're going to defeat these people. That's how we're going to defeat corporate greed, is by standing together. Yeah. You know, this is a historic moment, the first time in our country's history that a sitting USA president All right. has came out and stood on the picket line. Yeah. Our president has chose to stand up with workers in our fight for economic and social justice. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a historic day and a historic moment in time. You know, just as today, you know, it's about the auto workers who are part of the fabric of the working class of this country. Yeah. We're the people that make the world run. It's not the billionaire class not the elite few, it's the working class of the billions of people who have been left behind. That's what this battle's about, changing that. You know, what's going to move this, it's not some executive that owns our future, it's us. It's working class people from all walks of life. You know, it's what we decide to do together that's going to change it, it's going to shape the future of this earth and for future generations. And that's the economic reality that corporate executives don't want us to recognize. Yeah. I see these CEOs trying to justify a system where they take all the profit and the workers are left to fight for the scraps and live paycheck to paycheck. That's got to end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They say they deserve all the profit because they say they're different. You know what? They are different. They have different degrees. They have different responsibilities. They have different titles, different positions. You know what? I agree, though. They're different. We, let's talk about some of that. These CEOs sit in their offices. They sit in meetings, and they make decisions. But we make the product. <laughs> We make it run. The CEOs think the future belongs to them. Today belongs to the auto workers and the working class. And the difference between them and us is just as our theme song, Solidarity Forever, says 
without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel would turn. Come on, yeah. That's what's different about working class people. Whether we're building cars or trucks or running parts distribution centers, whether we're writing movies or performing TV shows, whether we're making coffee at Starbucks, whether it's nursing people back to health, whether it's educating students from preschool to college, we do the heavy lifting. We do the real work. Not the CEOs, not the executives. And though we don't know it, that's what power is. We have the power. The world is of our making. The economy is of our making. This industry is of our making. And as we've shown, when we withhold our labor... We've been listening, of course, to the UAW President Sean Fain speaking after President Biden joined him and the rest of uh, the members of the union we see there at the picket line. President Biden, in his remarks, told UAW striking auto workers to, quote, stick with it. He also said the UAW saved the automobile industry and made sacrifices in a statement just coming through from the White House that reads, the president joins the picket line in solidarity with the men and women of the United Auto Workers Union as they fight for a fair share of the value they helped create. And Shanali, of course, this is a historically significant moment, as we just heard from Sean Fain. This is the first time that a sitting U.S. president has actually joined striking workers at the picket line. But this, of course, is a president who has dubbed himself to be the most pro union president of all time. So we will continue to monitor uh, President Biden as he is there in Michigan and bring you any further remarks uh, that we may hear from him. But let's return now to the conversation related to crypto back here in Washington. Justin Slaughter of Paradigm is still with us. So, Justin, we were just talking about uh, the legislative prospects here in Washington in regard to crypto. In the meantime, though, do we have any real reason to believe that the SEC is going to change tack? Or are we going to see just more rapid enforcement actions rolling out because a potential congressional action is coming? So it's a great question, Kaylee. What I would say is that in many ways, the fact that there are all these enforcement actions is ipso facto proof that there is a regulatory gap and is why we need comprehensive legislation to pass. It, it's worth noting that I think 20 percent of American voters at present, according to private polling, own crypto or have owned crypto in the past. That's 52 million Americans. And I think that really speaks to the degree this industry has burst onto the scene in D.C. in a way that a lot of agencies are still getting their arms around, it, including Congress. When you think about what Congress has to do next, there are many parts of the crypto world that are still in question, staking, stable coins. If you have to choose a priority here, where do you want them to go first? It's such a great question. I, I think probably the number one thing to deal with is that which can move quickly. There's a discussion in certain parts of the Senate that stable coins represent the lowest hanging fruit. But I actually also think this is not a topic where you can cut once and then wait a few years. It would be probably better to address all of the matters. I'm a former uh, House and Senate counsel. It's rare that the gateways open up for legislative change in the U.S. very frequently. You often only get one big bite at a bill. So the more we can do at this time, probably, and solve a lot of things, the better. That is Paradigms. Justin Slaughter, we thank you so much for your time. Now, it has been a year of change for MoneyGram. They were taken private and announced a new board this summer. And now the company is detailing plans to launch a non-custodial digital wallet for users to seamlessly move from fiat to digital currency through stablecoin technology. Let's discuss this with CEO and chair Alex Holmes. Alex, you know, if you think about the future of payments and the uncertainty around digital currencies, why get in now? Yeah, you know, we've been doing um, a lot uh, over the last several years from a digital transformation perspective, and most of that is is driven by um, us and, and our focus on our customer and the customer's needs. And so we've been doing, um, last year we, we, we announced our partnership with the Stellar Development Foundation to try to move uh, crypto seamlessly through um, their non-custodial wallets and, and the Stellar network into uh, the fiat world and back again. And we've been able to do that successfully through uh, USDC Stablecoin in, in partnership with Circle. And we found that um, consumers really value that service, and we've been able to do that uh, using our, our standard KYC processes that we use in the, in the fiat world. And we feel like that's been a great balance between uh, the two worlds and is giving consumers uh, new, uh, new avenues to, uh, to move money. How fast can you actually get this to be used and used at scale? What are the hurdles that you'll face in between? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think your your last segment was was right up the alley on it, which is just around you know legislation. There clearly needs to be more government regu you know, regulation, legislation, um, straightforward understanding of of what the realm of the possible is for for crypto. Um, you know, at this point in time, our our new wallet that we're launching is is very basic in its in its in service, but it's also really unique and very cool in that sense because it's going to enable a consumer to take fiat, put it into stablecoin, hold it in their wallet, and withdraw it at their at their need uh, anywhere in the world uh, through the MoneyGram system. Doing that in a KYC way, um, you know, I think has many advantages over what's happening today. Um, the ability to, you know, think about on ramps and off ramps from both digital KYC and physical KYC, uh, and the ability to move uh, through the system seamlessly so that consumers can better time the delivery of service, consumers can better time the delivery of funds, um, you know, really changes that paradigm. And so I think what's going to happen over time as, you know, crypto continues to find ways into the mainstream market. The more that we're in the space today, the more that we're playing with it, the more that it's an add-on and a built-on to our current system, the more value it's going to create over time. And I think consumers will begin to uh, adopt that and see that um, as markets begin to change and shift. But Alex, and it's Kaylee in Washington, thanks so much for joining us. As we talk about value created, what about for MoneyGram specifically? What kind of revenue do you think you're going to be able to generate from this? Yeah, for now, the service is going to be free. Uh, and the reason for that is we're trying to get consumers to uh, to see it as a new way to, to send and receive. You know, over time, I think it can be um, an a actual different stream of revenue uh, in the sense that there are consumers who are going to always want to go through traditional fiat channels, but there's going to be a continued growth uh, and consumers really looking to uh, to move money uh, into the crypto world, out of the crypto world. Uh, consumers looking to time the transfers differently, to look at FX markets differently. And I think it could be a really nice bolt on an additional uh, piece of revenue for us uh, over time. And again, you know, these are early days, right? We're all kind of, um, you know, taking technology and applying it to, uh, you know, current services, current needs and trying to adapt then to um, customer behavior patterns and, you know, put the best product into the marketplace. Uh, we've seen a lot of adoption from consumers in the, in, in the crypto space, but it's still, you know, very nascent when you think about mainstream financial services. And so the more we can do these types of things, the more we can push innovation, uh, the more opportunity there is down the road to really change uh, the landscape and what, what the revenue streams can look like. Yeah, so nascent, Alex, that uh, as you were alluding to earlier, the ru rules around this are still being written on Capitol Hill, not just in terms of, you know, market structure, but there was a stablecoin bill as well that passed House Financial Services uh, before the August recess. On the subject of stablecoins, obviously right now you're using USDC. Do you have plans to expand that to other stablecoins as well? Yeah, I think the trick is 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 exactly, you know, what is the stable coin and how stable is it? And that really is what the legislative argument is all about. And I think that's also what the, you know, the, the broader concern is. I think the, the magic of a stable coin uh, is that you can seamlessly interoperate between cryptocurrencies. And in our case, we've we've actually been able to leverage it to move between fiat currencies and into cryptocurrencies and then back again. And as long as you believe in the value of the stable coin and as long as the stable coin can be, you know, demonstrated to be actually stable, uh, it's a wonderful asset and it's a, it's a great medium in, in which to make that exchange. Uh, you know, I think over time, uh, it would be great, you know, to to have validation of, of more and more stable coins, to be able to use different coins in the transaction flow. But again, it's that stability of the transfer. Our customers, right, are looking to save money. They're looking for the, the fastest, easiest, safest way to get money home. And they're also looking for that to be guaranteed. I mean, trust goes a long way. Security goes a long way. And so when you're in any environment, we're taking, you know, money in trust for customers as we pass it through our system today. And we do an amazing job of that. And so we're clearly in a position uh, to ensure that that continues to happen uh, and it needs to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. And so when we're partnering with anyone um, in that space, we want to make absolutely sure that those transactions are safe and secure. And so it does matter what is behind and, and backing that stable coin. And that will continue to be, I think, a big argument for uh, many, uh, you know, regulators around the world until we can prove, uh, you know, that certain stable coins are of uh, the stability that they say they are. Alex, how do you feel about the financial potential for MoneyGram through entering this space? You think about MetaMask, tens of millions of users. Is this the user base you're targeting? And what do you offer that's different than other non custodial wallets? Yeah, so yeah, it's a great question because at the moment, you know, what the non custody wallet's gonna do is really be an extension of the MoneyGram network. So it is going to, as we launch it, be uh, part of what we call, you know, the MoneyGram closed loop network. And in that sense, 
you know, we tend to provide interoperability of, of fiat currencies around the world, right? Our, our primary focus is to ensure that consumers can get money home safely and security, particularly cross borders. And so if someone's going to take, you know, 300 US dollars and put it into, into USDC and transfer it to their friend and then extract it, you know, down into, let's you know, say, a Mexican peso, you want to be sure that that's done seamlessly, efficiently and, uh, you know, uh, at their discretion. And so there's you know, going to be you know, a bit of a, a learning curve here. Baby steps, we're in beta testing right now. So far it's going extremely well, but you know, there's a lot to learn and, and a lot to, uh, to push forward. At the moment, you know, our core target demographic is, is, is a balance between um, you know, crypto users today and then also the traditional remittance uh, user as well. You know, the cross-border payments realm continues to be an area of focus for, for many new competitors. Uh, it's obviously what we do extremely well, and we're certainly here to uh, ensure that we've got you know the right product set, uh, the right product for our customers, and that we want that to work um, as seamlessly as, as possible. And so, you know, as we phase it in, and as we begin to you know adapt it to um, to new markets, and you know go country by country, it'll be fascinating to see sort of what those use cases become. And that's the greatest you know thing about innovation and new technology is that. You know, oftentimes you can create something, put it into market, and then you'll find that the use cases and, and sort of the desire uh, from a consumer is maybe a little bit different than what you thought it was. And so we're prepared for that. We're ready to adapt to it and uh, excited about it. But I do think that the user base over time you yeah. know, can be exponential. All right. Well, that's all the time we have uh, for now, Alex. But thank you very much for joining us. Alex Holmes, the CEO of MoneyGram. We appreciate it. Now, coming up in one week, Sam Bankman-Fried heads to trial for what has been called one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. We'll have a preview. And I do want to mention again that President Biden was just speaking in Michigan as he joined UAW union members on the picket line. The president telling workers to, quote, stick with it and said he agrees they should get a 40 percent wage increase. We will, of course, follow his trip and this story closely throughout the day. This is Bloomberg. Hey, first time I've ever done it as a president. Oh, sure. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines in Washington with Shanali Basik in New York. Well, Sam Bankman-Fried's legal team has made their third application for him to be released from prison last night, just one week away from the start of his trial. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ava Benny Morrison for more. So it's a week from today, literally, Ava. What are we going to be looking for come next Tuesday? Sam Bankman Fred's trial will open next Tuesday. Uh, straight out of the gate, we're going to be expecting the jury to be impaneled. Uh, that may take all day. And then the following day, we'll expect to hear from the prosecution what their case is against Sam Bankman Fred. Uh, they're alleging that he's committed this multi million dollar fraud or FTX. And then we may hear from the defense as well. What do we know about the cooperating witnesses here? What might they say? How much tension is baked into this idea that his closest friends might be called on to testify? These cooperating witnesses are definitely at the heart of the prosecution's case. One of the key ones is Caroline Ellison. She was the head of Alameda Research. She was also Sam Bankman frieds ex-girlfriend. So I think we'll expect to see a lot of tension between those two, and it'll be really interesting to see how that dynamic plays out in court. And just quickly, Ava, what's the deal with this prison release? It's just not going to happen for him? I don't think so. Uh, we were surprised to see him making a third attempt. He's asking the judge to release him from prison during the duration of his trial so he can be at his lawyer's offices working on his case every single day because he hasn't been able to do properly so in the um, MDC in Brooklyn. Ava, really quickly here also, when you think about how long this could go on for, uh, you know, what happens over the next couple of weeks and will it be conclusive? I think so. The trial is meant to last for up to six weeks. Uh, we saw today in a court filing that the prosecution may call up to 50 witnesses. So we're looking uh, to hear wow. from investor victims, colleagues, uh, former friends as well. All right. It's going to be a beast. Bloomberg's Ava Benny Morrison, thank you very much for the preview. And you can join us one week from today for a special edition of Bloomberg Crypto as we bring you the latest from the courthouse for this trial. That's next Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time. I myself will be up there in New York alongside Shanali Basik as well. So make sure to join us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.